an invisible beam that detects ships and airplanes, an innovative drug that reduces cholesterol in a way no one has tried before, the notion that tumors can be killed by choking off their blood supply. These things, radar, statins, and anti-angiogenesis drugs respectively, are taken for granted today. But when first proposed, they were laughed at, rejected, deemed impossible. Their champions were written off as crazy. But a recent book published this spring demonstrates that yesterday's crazy is today's breakthrough. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast brought to you by the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederly, senior writer with AHA. Safi Bacall is the author of the irresistibly titled Loon Shots, How to Nurture the Crazy Ideas that Win Wars, Cure Disease, and Transform Industries. Loon Shots, in bookstores since March, explores a new way of thinking about group behavior. It looks at how to generate and nurture the radical ideas that go from laughing stocks to driving up stocks and transforming entire industries. Safi received his BA in physics from Harvard, his PhD from Stanford, and was a Miller Research Fellow at UC Berkeley. After working for three years as a consultant for McKinsey, he co-founded a biotechnology company developing new drugs for cancer. He led its IPO and served as its CEO for 13 years. And in 2011, he worked with President Obama's Council of Science Advisors on the future of national research. Safi, thanks so much for joining me on Advancing Health today. Thanks for having me on your show, Tom. Appreciate you being here. In your book, you talk about how people and groups are similar to the phased transition of water from liquid to solid and the importance of having both phases. So it's an interesting analogy. What do you mean by that, and how does it apply to innovative ideas and thinking? Sure. The question of why groups will suddenly change behavior has been a mystery in the business world and in the social sciences for a long time. For example... In the business world, not many people realize that Nokia in the 1970s and 80s was famous mainly for its rubber boots and toilet paper. It was a giant conglomerate, mostly manufacturing. And then over the next 20 years, they pioneered the first cellular network, the first car phone, the first wildly successful DSM phone, and they transformed into the most successful mobile phone company in the world. They had one out of every two smartphones on the planet was being made by Nokia. They briefly became the most valuable company in Europe at $300 billion. Right around that time, a small group of engineers in 2004 suggested a wild idea. Let's make a big phone with a giant camera screen and make a touch screen and we'll do this thing, we'll sell applications in an online store. Now that same group, that same leadership team that had driven Nokia's success for 20 years shot down those ideas. Why? Not long after that small team of engineers in 2007, they watched from a distance and they saw their ideas materialize in a stage in San Francisco when Steve Jobs unveiled the iPhone. Within a few years, Nokia was irrelevant and a few years later it was sold at $7 billion. So it lost a quarter trillion dollars. Why? Why do good teams kill great ideas? Why do they suddenly change from embracing wild new ideas to rejecting them? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I learned about in the research for my book and the ideas that I came up with is exactly why that is. The science of why teens will suddenly change from embracing wild new ideas to rigidly rejecting them, just like a glass of water will change from liquid to a rigid solid. Mm -hmm. And although it sounds like an analogy, what makes it really exciting is that you can tease out what are those small factors like a small change in temperature that control the behavior of groups. And once you understand that, you can begin to manage it. You can design teams that innovate faster and better. And that's what this is all about. So it sounds like you're talking about balance um, in in the sense that neither state, water nor ice is is fully achieving things without the other. How do corporate and industry leaders, maybe using the Nokia example, how do they manage that tension between stasis and action and and deliver both high-quality services and innovation? That's exactly the problem. This is the big problem that comes out of this idea, which is whenever you organize people into a team or a company or even a nation, 
you create these two competing forces, this tug of war that ultimately drives a phase transition, a shift between liquid state and solid state, even on a highway, a shift between smooth flow and jam flow, or in a team of company, a shift between embracing wild new ideas and rejecting them. That's a big problem. Why? Because teams, companies, and nations have to do both. You can't just be one or the other. You can't just be a wild artist creating wild new stuff, and you can't just be a rigid soldier delivering everything on time, on budget, on spec. If you're just one or the other, mm -hmm. you won't survive. Teams need to be able to do both. Companies need to be able to do both. And this is a big problem because a glass of water cannot be liquid and solid at the same time. It just doesn't make any sense. Right. And if you try to be that, you'll just be mush. Actually, I got asked this one time, and somebody said, what about a Slurpee? <laughs> okay, just for the record, a Slurpee is a liquid. It's kind of a disgusting, sugary liquid <laughs> in which are suspended particles of ice right. that are rapidly melting. Okay, if you wait another five minutes, it'll be all disgusting, sugary liquid. We're talking about sustainably, mm -hmm. in equilibrium. How do you balance the core, the discipline, the execution, on time, on budget, on spec, consistently with coming up with a great new ideas to stay ahead of your competitors. The answer gives us a new model of leadership. You kind of throw away all this stuff that you read in magazines and books and glossy you know, journals with the, the great leader is this Moses that stands on top of a mountain and raises his or her staff and anoints the chosen loot shot, the holy project, whether it's you know the iPod or something else. That's not how any of this stuff ever worked in real history. The great leaders, the ones who build sustainable organizations, the ones that can do both, manage much more like careful gardeners, not Moses. They manage the touch and the balance mm -hmm. between these artists working on wild, crazy new things and the soldiers delivering stuff on time, on budget, on spec. Those two groups not only usually don't like each other, Usually the group that brings in the money doesn't like the group that spends the money. Not only do they usually not like they don't understand each other. One group is designed to minimize risk. You want to improve quality, everything on time, on budget, on spec. The other is designed to maximize risk. You want to push boundaries. If you're going to push boundaries in the way that you should be doing, you're going to break some and things will fail. That's a big problem. So the job of the leader, the answer to this balance, is to lead like a gardener, manage the touch and balance between these artists and the soldiers. And if you don't have enough people, if it's a small team, you manage the touch and the balance of the time. How do you spend your allocate your months and your years? Take one week off artist time, the rest of the time soldier time. That gives us a new way of thinking about what it means to be a great leader. Throw away all those books on culture and leadership that tell you you've got to be this Moses. Mm. That's the only way you can achieve a balance between the core and the new, between the artists and the soldiers. It doesn't sound easy, but it can be done. Absolutely. So to apply some of the leadership and managerial lessons in Loon Shots to the healthcare setting, uh, and specifically to affordability, you know, affordable health care is one of the biggest concerns facing families, employers, and government today, and it's a problem that hospitals grapple with daily. Affordability can determine a hospital size, its location, services, workforce, payroll, even access to capital. And these changes, of course, are, are challenges, I should say, are magnified in rural settings. So given the priority to ensure access to quality care and the challenges facing the healthcare industry, what can hospitals and health system leaders learn from other sectors to generate and nurture mold ideas? Absolutely. The key to surviving under rapidly changing conditions under changing regulatory environments uh, and very strong cost pressures is something I think of as the two types of loon shots. And here's what I mean by that. When we think of innovation, we typically think about products. The first telephone, the first transistor, the first digital camera, the first personal computer. But let me tell you a story about a young guy, age 32, who decides he wants to open a retail store. He likes selling stuff. So where is he going to do it? Well, in a big city, of course, because that's where people are. He thinks about St. Louis, but his wife says, uh, <clears throat> you know, 
honey, I love you and your dream, but I'm just not going to live in a big city. Happy to live with you anywhere you want as long as the population is less than 10,000. So this guy likes retail, also likes being married, but he also likes quail hunting. So there's a region in, uh, in the middle of the country where four states meet in a point, and they have four different quail hunting seasons. So that's where he puts his store in northwest Arkansas, Benton, Middle Arkansas, and he opens it up so he can hunt quail all year round. He had absolutely no idea how much demand there was in rural America for making stores a little bit bigger and selling stuff a little more cheaply. That guy, of course, was a young Sam Walton, and his stores are called now Walmart. All of the rest of the industry was wiped out, the retail industry. Walmart today, by rank, would be something like number 27 in the world by GDP if it was a country. There was no new technology. He just moved someplace different and sold stuff a little more cheaply. That is what we might call an S-type loon shot, a small change in strategy. No new product, just a small shift in strategy. So let me tell you why that's so important. And as an example, when you look at companies or organizations that have survived turbulent times, whether those are uh, rap, you know, strong cost pressures or changing regulatory environments, it's almost always because they've come up with that second kind of loon shot nothing to do with product. And it's so important because people have a blind spot. They just think product, 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 all the magazines you know, lie and ice the product innovators. But let me tell you an example from another heavily regulated industry, the airline industry. 1978, the FAA deregulated the airline industry. Every major airline went bankrupt because their costs were too high. And they just couldn't compete with these, all these new competitors that were sort of liberated, that figured out better cost structures. Every airline went bankrupt except for one, American Airlines. What did they do? Well, let me tell you what they did by comparison with Pan Am. You might remember Pan Am. Mm -hmm. A lot of people might yep. remember Pan Am. They even had a, a, a TV show recently about Pan Am stewardesses, I think. Pan Am was a classic product-focused P-type innovator. They had a blind spot on for that second type. What did they do? One trip with the founder and CEO of Pan Am, and he was, in many ways, an airline genius, a technical guy. He'd been a pilot. He loved engines. He brought the first jet engine to the United States. When everyone else in the industry said, no, 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 he brought jet engines, he brought radar navigation, he grew Pan Am into the largest, most dominant airline in the world. Their brand was number two in the world, second only to Coca-Cola. It was a wildly beloved airline. What happened? Product, product, product. Only focused on product. Kept building bigger, faster engines, bigger, faster planes. First plane, the 707, mm -hmm. then the 727, then the 737, then this huge engine, 747. When airline deregulation hit, what happened to Pan Am? It was flying a fleet of super big, super fast, super powerful, empty planes. Now, American Airlines was headed by a guy named Bob Crandall. He didn't know anything about airlines or engines. He had been at Hallmark Cards. He had been in banking. But one thing he did know is little small shifts in strategy, much less glamorous. Hub and spoke. Instead of flying direct everywhere, very expensive, let's pick a hub and f you know, save some steps, lowered costs. Created something called frequent flyers. Little, no new product. Mm -hmm. No new technology. There wasn't a computer there or a CCD chip there. It was just a new way of attracting customers and appealing to customers. Boom, his market share took off. He created something called Super Saver Fares. Boom, yeah. helped his market share. Here's a really wacky thing. He had a pretty good airline reservation system that his people used when people called up on the phone and wanted to book flights or agents called on the phone. He came up with a really wacky strategy. He said, Let's give our airline reservation system, our American airline system, to every travel agent in the United States for free. 
competitors said, what are you doing? You can't give your reservation system away for free. That's crazy. Really? Gave it away for free, and it was a pretty good system. So air, travel agents started using it. Guess what happened to American Airlines market share? Whoosh! Yeah. Way up. Now, it didn't just show American Airlines. It showed all their competitors. Did it show it super fairly? Did it direct them a little bit more to American Airlines? Of course it did. That was the point. Yeah. Guess what happened? Their market share went up. And when you're in a battle for costs, every fractional point of market share is life or death. I think he had, there was a quote from Bob Crandall. He said, airline business is the closest thing to legalized warfare. So, Pan Am, bankrupt. American Airlines and Bob Crandall, the only airline that survived. How did they survive? These small changes in strategy that lowered cost, made it more economical, more flexible. So if you're in a business, whether it's hospitals, or I spend, you know, I've talked to newspaper folks, film industry folks, uh, the music industry, if you're in a business that the core is being threatened, what you need to do is three things. Number one, you've got to address the problems in the core. If your customers don't like something, if it's kind of broken, you've got to address it, otherwise you really are dead. Number two, bridge a strength using some kind of S-type loon shot, which means some kind of small, crazy changes in strategy that no one thinks will work, that challenge accepted beliefs. Nothing to do with products. Mm -hmm. Just a small shift in strategy. Give away your reservation system. Frequent flyers, whatever. And then three, retrain your people to that new thing that you're doing. So that's what American Airlines did. Um, I'll give you another example, which really illustrates this point about small changes in strategy, not product, and making sure you don't have a blind spot. IBM. Some of your audience might remember when IBM meant computers. They were by far the most dominant computer company in the world. For 50 years, they completely owned the industry. It was called IBM and the Seven Dwarfs was the industry because their revenue is bigger than the next five, six, seven players combined. When the PC industry came by, they said, well, it's another product. It's not that the PC industry killed them. They said it's another product, so boom, okay, let's go after this product. They missed the fact, a small change in strategy, that people didn't really care about the brand on the box, the wrapper. What they really cared was standards, the stuff. They wanted to email photos to their friends. Mm -hmm. So what they really cared about was the operating system. That's what they needed. And the things inside called chips. Now, IBM didn't quite get that, and it had outlicensed that to two tiny companies. One was a 32-person company in Seattle called Microsoft. The other was a tiny company in Silicon Valley called Intel. Now those companies together are 5x or 10x of IBM's market value. So that, that actually didn't kill them. What almost killed them what almost drove IBM bankrupt in the early 90s was Unix. IBM had owned the hardware, had proprietary positions. When Unix came out, people said, well, wait a minute. We could get a server and uh, this Unix operating system. Well, Unix is kind of for free. So why do we need you guys? And they began to tank. They got really, really close to bankruptcy, this legendary American institution, this kind of icon of our country. What did they do? Those three things. Number one, they fixed the core. They realized that their products were just too old, too antiquated, and not appealing to customers because the prices were just unreasonable now. They had a monopoly, and they were forcing it down their customers' throats. Understandably, customers were not happy about that. So they fixed the core. They updated some things, and they actually lowered their prices. Can you imagine lowering prices if you're about to go bankrupt? Lowering your revenue. Number two, they said, well, what's our strength here? You know, it's really hard for us to compete in hardware. You know, there's hundreds now of little companies making hardware, and we just can't compete. Hundreds of companies making software. I don't know that we, we can't compete anymore. What did they do? They said, well, what's our strength? Our strength is our brand, and our relationships. We have 50,000 salespeople spread out over the country that have decades of relationships. No little company has that. 
And even though they may not like our products right now, we still have that brand and relationships. Mm -hmm. So what could we do? Well, wait a minute. If there are all these products and you're a guy that has to suddenly deal with 10, 20, 30, 50 different products and put them together, you kind of want somebody with a good brand and real relationships to do that for you, to help you pick and put them together. So they bridged the strength and said, you know what? Enough of us pushing proprietary IBM product. We're going to switch. We're going to go to a new thing where we are the solutions. We are the solutions providers, the integrators. We will do your shopping for you, and we will plug everything together. So they bridged the strength, and then they had to retrain. They had to partner with people that could help them do that, and they had to retrain their sales force because that's not what they were trained for. They did those three things. They fixed the core, bridged the strength, retrained their people. They closed the gap for the new skill. Within five years, their market value was up by 1,000%. They saved the company. That's a turnaround. Fix the core, bridge the strength, close the skill gap. So I wanted to end with an example that struck me recently is particularly relevant for hospitals in rural regions. And that is malls. So many people have written about the death of the mall. Well, it's almost like that airline example. Most malls are dying. Practically all malls are dying, but not everyone. Not Westfield. What is that company doing? Number one, they fix the core. All those old stores, those retail outlets that weren't trying particularly hard with their customers, that weren't digitally enabled, that hadn't modernized, out. Number two, they said, well, what's our strength? What's the need here that we have a strength for? Well, we're in these rural regions, and they want some kind of experience. You can't get that online. They want a place to go where they can have an experience. Now, we are a place to go. And we kind of have been providing experiences not that well, but suppose we did that a lot better. Suppose we became a reimagined town center, an experience center, and that's what they've done. They create events. They create festivals. You come in and you, get, you make appointments with trainers. They bring in the retail stores that are massively digitally enabled where you don't even buy stuff at the store. You come in, you make an appointment, let's say, with Nike for a trainer. Do you buy the shoe there? No. You actually have an app, and it tells you which shoe, and it sends it to your home. That's a small shift in strategy. Why is that great? Well, you're no longer an inventory center. You no longer have to hold the shoes. You no longer have to say no when they don't have the right size. You don't have to ship it. To, you don't have to have them bring it back to you for refunds. You can take that time and energy and money and invest it in creating experiences. Bring in five-star restaurants. You bring in hotels. You bring in apartments totally reimagined. That's kind of like what American Airlines did. They just reimagined the airline for this new world. The rural malls, Westfield reimagined them for this new kind of Amazon world, digitally enabled world. Where is our strength? What's the unique need which Amazon can't fulfill? Let's jump on that. And that's exactly what they did and survived. And the lesson for rural hospital administrators? You've got to, number one, fix the core. Okay, you got to start addressing, you know, what are your customers satisfied and really excited about and what are they dissatisfied about? Because something's not going well. If things are going down, they're obviously dissatisfied and looking elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So you got to understand that and fix that core. You got to upgrade your systems if you're IBM. You got to upgrade the digital experience. Number two, you got to find out what is a strength that you can bridge. In the case of hospitals and rural hospitals especially, they're like IBM. They're a trusted brand. You don't want to go on. If I was there, I wouldn't want to go online and outsource my care to some internet thing God knows where. I want something in my community where I can see people who are in my community and be connected to people, just like the malls. You make them an experience center, a healthcare and wellness experience center, just like you reimagine the mall for the Amazon world of the 21st century. You reimagine the rural hospital 
for the digitally enabled 21st century as an experience center? What's the one thing that you guys can do that no online massive conglomerate could possibly do? Create experiences. Create wellness experiences and community experiences, festivals, events, lectureships, group sessions, I don't know about five-star restaurants, but maybe you join forces with them all. I mean, you know, just brainstorming here the possible small changes in strategy. No new product. You don't need a better dialysis machine. You need a small a change in strategy, just like Westfield changed what it meant to be a mall. An American changed what it meant to be a national airline. Mm -hmm. So that's – and IBM changed what it meant to be a big computer company. We're not making hardware. We're selling – hardware solutions services. So that's what I mean. Those are the lessons. In 2005, you know, another book was published that year that really reminds me a lot of yours, and that book was called Freakonomics, A Rogue Economist Explores the Hidden Side of Everything. That book was a big deal. It challenged uh, common economic assumptions. It turned conventional wisdom on its head, sold really well, <laughs> and critics really adored it. Uh, are you hoping that Loon Shots has the same impact on our understanding of progress and success? Uh, thanks. Well, it's certainly flattering to be compared to that book. It was a super fun read and great storytelling, and I've gotten that uh, you know, comment a few times. And in some ways, Freakonomics is about the hidden forces at work that drive individuals, and Moonshots is about the hidden forces of work that change the behavior of teams and companies, and then how you can use them. I think the difference is, uh, or the way I think about it, is Freakonomics is a wonderful collection of stories not really connected. Loonshots is a series of stories where each page builds on the previous page and it goes up to a conclusion, a big bang about world history and why the world speaks history. So I did have one uh, reviewer, I think it was a Senator Kerry said, uh, compared the book, he said, Loonshots is what happens if Freakonomics and the Da Vinci Code met and had a baby together. I love it. Great analogy. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you've been listening to Safi Bacall, whose new book, Loon Shots, How to Nurture the Crazy Ideas that Win Wars, Cure Disease, and Transform Industries, is in bookstores right now. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Advancing Health, a podcast brought to you by the American Hospital Association.